Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tina Fernandez, and I'm the Executive Director of Achieve Atlanta. And we are so excited um, to welcome you and to have you here um, to hear some exciting news um, from lots of our partners at Achieve Atlanta. Um, at Achieve Atlanta, we envision an Atlanta where race and income no longer predict post-secondary success and upward mobility. And when we were founded in 2015, only 14% of an entering freshman class at Atlanta Public Schools was predicted to earn a post-secondary credential of any kind within six years of their graduation. Yet, we know that by 2025, 65% of the jobs in Georgia will require some sort of post-secondary credential. And when you consider that a person with a college degree will earn over $1 million more than their non-degree holding peers in a lifetime. When you consider that a college graduate has a longer life expectancy, lower unemployment, higher job satisfaction, and is more likely to earn a family sustaining wage. And when you consider that a college graduate can end poverty, generational poverty in their family forever, then you know that it is a tragedy when we don't get enough students to that finish line and give them the opportunity to earn a post-secondary degree. And it's no wonder then that Atlanta has been named the city with the lowest rate of social mobility and the highest income inequality for several, several years in a, row, in, a row, in a row. That's the bad news. But the good news is that we have set out to change that. And through the power of intentional collaboration, mutual accountability, and collectively held goals, we are changing the story of Atlanta. We're so excited to be able to share with you today the results of our external evaluation and let you hear from some of our team members and partners. They're gonna share more about our work and our steadfast belief that we can make a positive impact on some of our most pressing social problems when we work together. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to my Achieve Atlanta colleague, Corinne Schooley, who serves as our Vice President of College Access. She'll walk us through the Achieve Atlanta mission, vision, and how our model leverages a cross-sector approach to serve our students. Corinne. Thank you so much, Tina, and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm super excited uh, to be able to, to talk with you all today. Um, I'm going to give you a high-level overview of our um, the Achieve Atlanta model. I know many of you on this call are familiar with us, but some of you are just getting to know us. So allow me a couple of minutes um, to share Achieve Atlanta with you. As Tina mentioned, uh, we started uh, back in 2015 as a result of some research that found that only one in seven entering ninth graders in Atlanta public schools was predicted to earn any type of post-secondary credential within six years of their high school graduation. And with an eye towards changing those numbers, we started to work to help Atlanta public school students access, afford, and earn post-secondary credentials. All of this in an effort to change the city of Atlanta, such that neither race nor income predicts post-secondary success or upward mobility. I do wanna be clear that when we're talking about credentials and college, we define them inclusively. We support students who are pursuing their bachelor's degree, associate degree, technical certificate, or credential. Next slide, please. We do this through what we like to call cross-sector collaboration. That means we bring organizations and stakeholders together to work around the table, to set common goals, track data, design interventions, collectively decide to try new things and abandon what's not working. We recognize that Achieve Atlanta cannot do this by ourselves. It takes multiple organizations with different expertise and vantage points to tackle this big, hairy, challenging problem of closing the degree divide in Atlanta. We do this work across the college going pipeline really starting during junior year of high school. We work with Atlanta public schools, in particular their counselors, their career technical and agricultural education department, and their data and information team. Equally as important are key nonprofit organizations, college advising corps, and one goal. 
And collectively, we ensure that students have access to quality college advising. What that means is we provide students with information, tools, and supports to make strong decisions about where to apply to college, how to secure financial aid to help them pay for college, complete all those pre-matriculation tasks that if not handled can lead to summer melt, and ultimately enroll in a college that is a strong academic match and good personal, social, and financial fit. Achieve Atlanta may be most well known for our need-based college scholarship. So this is a scholarship that supports students who graduate from Atlanta Public Schools with a GPA of at least a 75, complete the FAFSA, meet our income requirements, and be enrolled in APS for their final two years of high school. The scholarship provides $5,000 a year for up to four years for those pursuing their bachelor's degree and $1,500 a year for those who are pursuing their associate's degree or a technical credential. This program supports about 650 to 850 students per year, which is about one third of APS graduates who go on to become Achieve Atlanta scholars, attending more than 400 colleges across the country, excuse me, across the country. In addition to that signature program, we have a couple of grant programs to help students directly afford their college education. The first of those is an emergency grant program that provides up to $500 for our scholars who face an unexpected emergency that challenges their ability to persist in college. In partnership with Scholarship America, this program has supported more than 800 scholars with help with car, for car repairs, medical bills, and other items since the spring of 2020. We also have a completion grant program that provides one to two semesters of funding to help our scholars who have exhausted their Achieve Atlanta scholarship eligibility, but are still some credit short of earning their degree. We, uh, with that completion grant program, we provided almost 200 grants to our scholars, and so far nearly 80% of those recipients have completed their degree. In addition to need-based financial assistance, we support our scholars' college success by employing that cross-sector collabor collaboration model to partner with 10 higher education institutions in Georgia and nonprofits beyond 12 and EduTech. One of our higher education partners, Kennesaw State University, is represented on the webinar today, along with nonprofit partner Beyond 12. So you'll get to hear from both of them. Staff from these organizations provide our scholars with one-on-one -on -one coaching and advising to connect them to academic tutoring, mental health supports, and to really help them navigate what are sometimes really complex systems and barriers, such as financial aid verification, satisfactory academic progress appeals, and registration holds. Moreover, these partners, along with near peer ambassadors on each of our college partner campuses, are building welcoming, inclusive, and engaging communities to foster a sense of belonging among our scholars in college. Over the past couple of years of the pandemic, we've also added support such as access to professional mental health counselors for scholars and their families, a scholar job board to help students find internships and jobs, and an online scholar community where scholars can connect across campuses. And finally, in addition to the organizations mentioned and on the slide, Achieve Atlanta also engages directly with students and families to ensure their experiences and feedback inform our model and that we continuously, continuously improve to better meet their needs. I hope that helps you more deeply understand Achieve Atlanta and our model. And I'm now going to turn over the mic to Dr. Jonathan Smith. Dr. Smith is an Associate Professor of Economics at Georgia State University and a faculty fellow with the Georgia Policy Labs, which improves children's and families' lives through rigorous research and long-term government partnerships. Dr. Smith is one of the three researchers on this project, and he's going to sh share the results with you today. Dr. Smith. Thanks, Corinne. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'll, I'll try to keep my, my words short so we can get on to some a little more discussion. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to work with Achieve Atlanta. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the people I collaborated with, Lindsay Page from Brown University and, with, and uh, Kerry Cruz Bueno from Wesleyan University. Uh, and we, we sort of work together to, to think about what are the impacts of Achieve Atlanta scholarship and services on students' uh, outcomes. So next slide, please. Just really briefly to give you a background of what we were trying to do in the study. So we really had three primary research questions that we focused on. 
First, does the Chief Atlanta Scholarship and their support services impact college persistence and completion? That's where I'll spend a fair amount of time today. Do those effects differ by student's high school GPA? So does this scholarship and the services impact students differently? And lastly, or related, does the scholarship and services support, uh, do, do those things impact the way students decide whether to go to college and, and where they go to college? To do that, we, of course, we need data. And so we are very appreciative to all those who helped facilitate that process. That included the Atlanta Public Schools. We got student level data, some background information, notably things like high school GPA to see whether students were eligible for, for the scholarship or not on, on that dimension. Uh, we also got information from Achieve Atlanta on who applied and whether or not they received the scholarship, how much they received, et cetera. And lastly, these data were supplemented with the National Student Clearinghouse data. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's essentially close to a census on who goes to college and where they go to college and whether they persist and eventually graduate over time. So we put all those together and then we could get a sort of a look over time to see how students progress through their from high school to college. In terms of methods, I'll be super brief, uh, but really we use some regression analyses and the, the kind of the intuition behind it was we're trying to compare scholars to non-scholars and see how their outcomes differ from one another. But of course, within this regression framework, we're essentially accounting for the differences between scholars and non-scholars who, who may not always be identical to one another. Those could be things such as demographics, high school GPA, financial need, whether they're even interested in going to college or receiving the scholarship. So we're trying to get an apples to apples comparison of students, one of whom receives the scholarship and one of whom doesn't, or one of whom might be eligible for the scholarship and one of whom might not be eligible for the scholarship. That last little thing I just mentioned is if for, the, for you uh, researchers out there, we use a regression discontinuity analysis uh, for, some of our, for some of our research, which really compare people with almost identical high school GPAs. Next slide, please. So this is kind of one of the main results that really popped in a nutshell, and I'll, I'll walk you through the slide really quickly. But essentially what we're doing is we're showing persistence rates for scholars and non-scholars across the uh, different time periods, year one, two, and three, and four of their, of their potential college uh, enrollment. And what we see the, is that these blue bars, which represent the persistence rates of scholars, are always consistently higher than the gray bars, which are the persistence rates of non-scholars. So for example, on the far left, this is the persistence rate into the second semester of the first year, and scholars persist at a 93% rate, whereas non-scholars persist at an 82% rate. That's an 11 percentage point different, which is really quite large in magnitude. And note that these are not just raw differences, this is within the regression framework. So we're accounting for all these differences between scholars and non-scholars that might have explained these differences. But after, even after counting for those things, these gaps remain. Okay. If you move to the right, to, this, to the second set of columns, you, in the year whether or not students persisted to the second year of college, scholars persisted at a 77% rate, non-scholars at a 67% rate. Again, about a 10 percentage point difference in that probability of persisting, very large in magnitude. And of course, if you look to the right, that sort of continues on, that pattern continues. In year three, there's an 11 percentage point difference. In year four, it's, a, it's about an eight percentage point difference. And although it's not shown of one, when we started our analysis, it's using the 2016 high school graduating cohort. They had the opportunity to graduate within four years and that would have been reported in our data. And we see that these persistence rates carry through to on-time college completion where there is a, a, a gap uh, where scholars are doing quite a bit better on that dimension as well. Next slide, please. So that, the previous slide was about that first question, whether scholarship and service rece receipt impacts students' ability to persist. The second, this next slide of results is about whether it differs by students' high school GPAs. Okay. So what we have highlighted here in this red box are students with GPAs between high school GPAs between 80 and 85 and 85 and 90 separately. But again, we still have these blue and, and gray bars representing scholars and non-scholars respectively. So what you can see is very, these, these, are based, these are the persistence rates into the second year of college, whether or not students persisted. So you can see with students who have a high school GPA of 80 to 85, 
they will per, scholars will persist at a 70% rate, non-scholars at a 56% rate. So 14 percentage point gap. And, and again, these are regression adjusted. So we're comparing apples to apples. A very similar relationship in the 85 to 90 G, high school GPA range. And this is where a lot of students who are scholarship recipients are, are, are sort of their GPAs lie. So there's a lot of people in this, in this sort of bandwidth of GPAs between 80 and 90, uh, and where that's where we see the strongest effect. So if you go to the sort of dully shaded, uh, if you draw your attention to the dully shaded bars that are outside this red box, to the left, you see students who have GPAs of 75 to 80. These students are still eligible for the Chief Atlanta Scholarship and Services, uh, but more like they're very likely to go to two-year college as opposed to a four-year college and maybe and receive less in scholarship. Uh, we don't see uh, a difference in their probability of persisting to their second year. Similarly, if you go to the right of the red box, you see students who have GPAs 90 and above, so 90, 95, or 95 to 100. We also don't see any disparities between scholars and non-scholars. So the, the sort of the biggest effects are in the spot where most students reside in terms of high school GPAs. Now, we don't know exactly why this is. We can't say definitively, but I don't think it's a coincidence that these students between 80 to 90 are students who might have more unmet need than students outside that, particularly from 90 to 100. A lot of these students, particularly 80 to 85 GPA, are going to be eligible for the HOPE Scholarship, an important source of financial aid in, in Georgia, um, and 85 to 90, a, a little bit less so as, as well. And certainly the, these individuals will uh, not be very unlikely to receive the Zell Miller Scholarship as well. So we can't prove that, that the HOPE Scholarship is, is, is part of the story here and why the effects are so large for this group, but it's certainly a story that's pretty compelling. Uh, since these students tend to have unmet financial need. Next slide, please. So I just want to conclude with uh, kind of three, three small thoughts about those, those main results. So the, the first point is about college enrollment, which was the third research question. And we don't see increases. We don't see statistically significant increases for students who are eligible for the scholarship. So who have GPAs just high enough, say like an 80 versus a 79 to receive the higher amount of the Achieve Atlanta Scholarship and Services than those who don't. So we're not seeing big impacts on the probability of enrolling in college or the type of college to which students enroll. But there's kind of two points to that. One is this is pretty similar and it's a kind of a consistent re result that we see in other similar programs to Achieve Atlanta, where a lot of things like financial aid are really good at helping students succeed once they're in college and not necessarily on whether they're enrolling in college. Second point is, uh, I use the word statistically significant intentionally. We, this was somewhat of an imprecise analysis. And so we, basically what we say is that we cannot find really large effects, but it doesn't mean that there are absolutely no effects. We're just not able to dis distinguish that statistically. Most of the effects, which are really, really precise and large in magnitude, were on this college persistence and completion. End. Second, Implications, what does this mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, I think it's pretty clear from those bar, bar graphs that Achieve Atlanta seems to be helping students succeed academically. They're persisting at much greater rent, rates, but there's a lot more to consider and a lot more to learn. Questions about why this is happening, for whom is it happening, and, and again, why is it happening to those people is particularly important. Um, and so, so there's a lot more to learn and we hope to go on to that process. Which brings me to the last point about future research. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this sort of grant funded research practice partnership. So Achieve Atlanta and, and myself and some other folks at Georgia Policy Labs, which is part of Georgia State University, formally received this grant to engage in a research practice partnership. And we're really following up on some of these results that we have and looking into a, how this is affecting students' ability to finance their education, how it affects their scholarships and grants, and some other things that are just not available in the data that was available in this initial project. So we're really excited to think about um, financial implications of you know, interacting with Achieve Atlanta. And with that, I will uh, end talking about my research, and I'd like to pass it on to Suzanne Diggs-Wilbrowen, 
who is the Chief Atlanta's Vice President of College Success. And she's gonna help facilitate a, a panel discussion which is reflecting on some of these results to which I just shared. So, thank you. Thank you, John. We're going to transition now to our panel discussion and we hope you'll also join the discussion by submitting your questions for our panelists via the Q&A box. When you ask a question, please include your name, organization, and where you're joining us from so we will know who you are. If we don't get to your question, we will respond uh, or provide a response via email. We also invite you to share what you're hearing via social media with hashtags, believe, expect, achieve, and don't forget to tag us and our partners. You can see all the handles on this slide and we'll drop them in our chat. Now let's start with introductions. Uh, Alexandra Bernadotte is the founder and CEO of Beyond 12. Alex has more than 18 years of executive management and strategic development experience in both the nonprofit and private sectors. Immediately before launching Beyond 12, she was the entrepreneur in residence at New Schools Venture Fund, where she conducted the research and developed a business plan for Beyond 12. Alex received her undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College and earned a master's degree with a concentration in policy and organizational leadership from Stanford. Fast Company also recently named Beyond 12 one of the top, world's top 10 most innovative companies in education. Welcome, Alex. Also joining us is Brittany Bartholomew. Brittany is the Achieve Atlanta Program Coordinator at Kennesaw State University. In this position, Brittany has identified opportunities for increasing program efficiency and effectiveness and has assisted in increasing program participation by 40%. Before Kennesaw State University, Brittany was the Achieve Atlanta Retention Coordinator at Georgia State University, where she managed a team that increased program participation by 23%. Brittany holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Valdosta State University and a Master of Science in Higher Education from Georgia Southern University. Welcome, Brittany. And you have already met John. So I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining into this conversation. So to start off the discussion, I'm going to turn to John first. So John, uh, Georgia Policy Lab saw the results and really pressure tested the evaluation results. Can you tell us more about what surprised you about the results and what makes them so noteworthy? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think it's pretty clear from the bar charts that the, the impact on persistence is really large in magnitude. Um, they're, they're, they're actually quite large uh, relative to some other work in the area. And so as a researcher, I, I, I really try to avoid being wrong. So nothing's thrown back in my face. And that means I typically err on the side of being conservative in my estimates. So we did everything that we could to, we, we saw these initial results and we said, okay, what can we throw at it to make the results smaller? Can we make them disappear? What reason could someone be a scholar versus not be a scholar that might be explaining these results? Things from different amounts of financial need or they go to different types of colleges or perhaps students didn't apply to achieve Atlanta. Uh, we basically threw all those things at it and we just could not get these results to disappear. Certainly couldn't even get them to, to dwindle in, in magnitude. So, uh, you know, I, I think that the short answer is it, it's, it's quite clear that the results are large in magnitude and, and they're pretty robust. And so that just the magnitude in and of itself was what was surprising to me. Thank you, John. And Alex and Brittany, as a follow up to John's question, what did each of you take away from the findings uh, after all of this pressure testing and, and the results being what they are? How do you see your organization's work in these results? And Alex, let's start with you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, first of all, congrats to Achieve Atlanta. I just want to put that out there. Um, I think it is amazing. These results are, are amazing, as John um, just talked about. And it is a testament to the hard work of everybody at the organization, Tina, Suzanne, and everyone else. So just want to start with the, with the kudos. Um, and secondly, I think my reaction was that this is not surprising, right? Like the results certainly feel like a reflection of our initial hypotheses about what a cross-sector, um, close trust-based collaborative could do um, to improve persistence and graduation results. And so for me, again, it's the kudos, but also that I'm not surprised that these are the results that we're getting, particularly because of the thoughtful and careful approach that Achieve Atlanta has taken um, and your just unapologetic commitment 
<laughs> to students and families. Thank you, Alex. Brittany, is there anything you would like to add? Yes, yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, I do want to add, just like Alex, I'm not surprised. Coming from two different organizations, I had a chance to see the impact it had on students. So seeing it for all over, it looks like multiple campuses is having an impact. It didn't surprise me as well. Um, as for what I see in the findings from our organization, I can say um, we've done a great job of supporting students during their journey. So what that looks like at our institution is providing one-on-one -on -one connections through our coaching or having a student ambassador that insists them in their journey. Um, we also provide them with uh, workshops and events that they can go through throughout the semester to talk about tips. And lastly, we ensure that we connect our students with correct resources. So I do think the one-on-one -on -one connections, in addition to having the right resources, has aided them to persist. And like I said, it doesn't seem like a surprise them because we have other institutions doing the same thing and impact, impacting the students as well. Thank you, Brittany. So both you and Alex talked about the partnership you have with Achieve Atlanta. Um, I'd like to ask both of you, what is unique about partnering with Achieve Atlanta? And Brittany, let's start with you. Okay, so what's unique about Achieve Atlanta, I would say one is the constant communication. Um, from there, also the support that you provide for students and also your partners. So at Constant Communications, I've worked with different programs and with Achieve Atlanta, we don't meet once a year. It is throughout the semester, we're doing data-driven meetings, we're speaking of how we can establish and review the goals that we have, plans that we have for upcoming semesters, and even had meetings talking one-on-one -on, -one on how we can support students, calling them by name, what resources can we give our students. Uh, something else that's unique about working with Achieve Atlanta, I have to say, are the resources that you have for scholars. So not only are myself and my team can say, this is campus resources you have, let's tap into some of the resources that Achieve Atlanta has for students, whether it's the emergency grant or mental health resources that Corinne mentioned earlier. And lastly, something else that's really unique about Achieve Atlanta is support that you give us as a partner. Whether it's the partner learning form, we have a chance to learn from other partners what they're doing. I tend to come back with so many different practices I can utilize to help my students. Something else that's great is the funding that you give for our students, right? So they can have events, whether it's a de-stress fest or a workshop. And lastly, it's the training that you give our ambassador that serves as the peer mentor for the students in our population. So what's unique about Achieve Atlanta is constant communication. It's also gonna be the support that you provide for our students and for your partners as well. Thank you, Brittany. Alex? So I'm going to plus one on everything that Brittany <laughs> said. And to avoid duplication, I might just focus on a few other things, but definitely plus one to all of that. And Suzanne, you know, so we are a national organization. We're working with um, lots of partners across the country, currently supporting about 96,000 students on our platform, and we're coaching students, right? And so we do this coaching work with so many partners. And so the work with Achieve Atlanta for us has been so unique because of a couple of different things. Um, I mentioned this earlier, it's that trust-based collaboration, right? It is built on trust. And that trust was initially just garnered because we, together did what we said we were going to do, right? That we set out a plan, we created a plan, um, and we continued to deliver against that plan and we honored, right? Like our um, both ends of the bargain and that kind of trust has only just blossomed as we have continued to work with you. But you trust us to do the work, we trust you to do the work, and we're able to have very honest conversations um, when potentially some of the work that we're doing together doesn't work. And that is very rare, right? To be able to find a partnership that is so deeply um, based on trust. And you and I talk about this all the time, right? The, the work moves at the speed of trust. And so if you don't have that um, in a partnership, it's very difficult to achieve some of the results that that uh, we're talking about today. The second is mission and vision alignment, right? So Achieve Atlanta has made sure that all of our partners, all of your partners are aligned and bought into your vision, that we want to make sure that race and uh, socioeconomic status no longer predict college persistence, graduation outcomes, and economic mobility. And I feel like all of the partners that you've gathered are singularly focused on that and that we are aligned um, on, on our vision and mission. The third is focus on data, 
and using the power of data to tell the stories of our students' success. And so we have been rigorous in terms of measuring uh, persistence, measuring graduation, measuring other outcomes, and also uh, just really persistent on using the data to be able to tell the individual stories. And so while we can look at the aggregate data, we never lose sight that our students may be an N of one um, as you're looking at the aggregate, but that we are able to tell those individual um, student stories. And then the last two that I will say is the learning mindset. And so Achieve Atlanta is open to learning and open to being on this journey with us. When we get data or we get feedback from students about something not working, we've been able to pivot very quickly and say, okay, what else can we do? What are some of the other pieces of this that we may not get or understand? And how do we listen to students first to allow us to make those decisions? But let's be focused on um, not our solutions, but on the problem, right? And then let's just be um, clear when those things aren't working about how we may change them to ensure that they're working. And then the last thing I would say, I said this before, you are unrelenting and unapologetic about your focus on students and families first, right? That that is always the source of the conversation and that's always the starting point. You know, how do we ensure that our students are getting the best support that they possibly can? How do we make sure that their families are supported? And how do we ensure that as we move forward, we continue, right? We continue to focus um, all of our efforts and all of our, our work on, on students and then hearing what students have to say. Thank you both. And, you know, I, I appreciate what you all are saying. We do, and we are happy to be partnering with, with both of you as, as well as the rest of our partners. That through line being trust, um, I think is the cornerstone um, that we appreciate as well and honor in our partnership. So thank you. Um, John, Anything do you, that you want to add to this conversation about partnership? Um, well, first and foremost, it's, I, it's actually really interesting to hear from Alex and Brittany because I, I just see the numbers. And so hearing the, the stories of what's going on with the partnerships is, is great and puts color on, on what I'm doing. Um, so, so I, but I'll, I'll respond to your question kind of uh, from the researcher's lens in kind of two quick ways, if you don't mind. So one is each, there's a lot of, organizations out there across the country that do some similar things that Achieve Atlanta does. And there's been a lot of evaluations of them, but each of them are unique in their own way. And Achieve Atlanta is certainly no exception. And so seeing the package of services and, and support that they offer to students is really important to sort of figure out what's working when you're sort of comparing across organizations and institutions that are doing similar things. So that I, I find pretty interesting. So, so I, I really enjoy hearing what's going on kind of behind the scenes. Secondly, um, I think what's, what's really important here and, and why it's interesting to work with uh, Achieve Atlanta and in this space is because context matters, right? I, you know, I think that's often, that's kind of like, it could be a vacuous statement, but I think it's really important here in the state of Georgia where there's a lot of merit aid for, for higher education and less so for need-based aid. And so Achieve Atlanta is helping to fill that gap. And so, you might get very different results in a different context, but knowing this sort of unique context that Achieve Atlanta is playing in and the students that they're serving uh, makes for uh, a particularly interesting research question. Thank you, John. And, and that's a great segue as you talk about sort of this context. Um, what do you think are some of the policy and implications of the results of, of this research? So, so, if you're, if you're particularly interested in every specific recommendation, you can read the academic paper, which is posted online. Uh, but to be, to be short about it, I think you know, it, it's quite clear to me that all the, everything that we did shows that there's an improvement in persistence and completions rate, completion rates. And so what that means to me is, well, how can we make that better for more people? Right? And so and I think there's two ways to think of that. There's sort of how can Achieve Atlanta specifically do that? And that's some things that we talk about in, in the research, um, but uh, but it but it also you know maybe means ex making it more accessible the scholarship and services to students, making sure people receive the full weight and support uh, for those who might be underutilizing some of the services uh, in, in that dimension. But I, I think there's also sort of a kind of a national policy implication of well look need-based aid is, is, seems to be particularly important um, and, and, and giving access to more students that this, this type of support can be really fruitful. 
But I think, you know, one thing that I think is also, it's not just need-based aid in per, per se, but I, I love these ideas of these place-based scholarships where the whole community is in it together. And so it's not just one individual who's getting based aid uh, and, and partially merit-based as well, but there's a whole set of students who are working towards the same goal and people helping them to do that. So there's, so everyone's reinforcing one another. And, and I think that's an important implication of the work that this isn't just need-based aid, it's need-based aid with support in a particular place. And other, and other places can learn from that as well. Thank you, John. Um, Alex and Brittany, what do you think about what John just shared? Um, Alex, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean that John is absolutely right. <laughs> we need more need-based aid models in Georgia and across, across the country because the data are irrefutable, right? And so this is just, I am so um, just pleased that the Achieve Atlanta data just adds to a body of research already out there. Um, we have the data that need-based aids ma um, matters. But I think it's, it's the other part of what John says, the money enough, alone enough, is not enough. And we've known that and we've seen that through scholarship research and other research that the money is an important component and we have to make sure that we provide that financial support, but we can't stop at the financial support, right? That we have to also create these wraparound services for our students to ensure that they are persisting and graduating. And so what I love about the, the, this research with Achieve Atlanta is that it makes the case for both. Um, and I think that it is evidence and data that we can take across the country, we can take to institutions, right, not just at the state level, but also that we can take um, this data to institutions and continue to make the case that need-based aid is the fuel. Need-based aid and support are the fuel that allow us to say to students that we believe in you and you are worthy of a college education regardless of your ability to pay. Thank you, Alex. Brittany, any thoughts about what John just shared and, and along with what Alex just shared? I would say I agree with both of them. Obviously, I hope that this data, in addition to all the data out there, would hopefully prompt Georgia policymakers to explore need-based scholarships, but also that support. Who will be providing that support to other students so that they can persist, even in addition to having the funds to attend an institution? Thank you. So. Obviously, there's a lot to celebrate in this evaluation, but according to recent data from the National Student Clearinghouse, we're seeing a national decline in post-secondary enrollment for the third year in a row. And we are certainly seeing that here in Georgia, as well as in the Metro Atlanta region. We know COVID is a big part of the equation, but where should we start with understanding the root causes of this decline? And Brittany, I'll start with you. I know, you know you're at Kennesaw State University and both, both you and Alex you know, have services that directly uh, service students. So given this information, where do you think we need to start um, with understanding the root causes of this decline in enrollment? So I think we should start by reviewing some of the data that is out there that highlights some of the components that contribute to the decline. There's so many different factors, um, some being cost of attendance, the rise of that, so some students saying they don't want to take on additional debt. Uh, another thing that has been highlighted is this renewed interest in different pathways from out of high school, of course. Um, so I think we start by reviewing the different factors and working university-wide to see how we can address it and also with our partners like Achieve of Atlanta, how can we also address some of these factors that maybe are affecting Atlanta students? Um, if it's cost of attendance, can KSU assist by possibly having our financial advisor come by and talk about the scholarships that are available so they're not deterred, right? They're, we can say, hey, achieve Atlanta, but here's some other additional funds that you can go um, and apply for. Something else we've done for our students that are currently on campus that we would love to hopefully partner with Achieve Atlanta is a, a scholarship writing workshop, right? How do we increase your chances of getting these funds if we know this is one of the factors? There's so many, right? But if it's, this is one of the factors, Achieving Land Scholarship is amazing, but what else can we add to not deter you from enrolling to an institution and achieving your dreams? Thank you, Brittany. Alex? Alex, do you have anyone, anything to add? 
Oh, I, I do. No, no, no. Absolutely. I was having a little problem with my mute button. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, um, again, I think I just want to um, just retweet everything that Brittany has said. Um, and then I would like to just add um, maybe a bit of a structural, you know, sort of uh, view about this. I think we all know that while COVID may have exacerbated the challenges that our students are facing on their college journey, these challenges are not new. COVID has done what many of us have said, has shone a bright light on the structural barriers that our students have always faced on the road to earning a college degree. So the root causes of the decline in enrollment are what they've always been. Our higher education system is not designed for our students, was not designed for our students. Um, the system is not broken. It's achieving the results it was designed to achieve, which has opened the path of opportunity for a select few and close it for many others. And the many others are the students that we're honored to serve together. So I think the current enrollment declines are a continued reflection of the fact that anytime you add an external high pressure event like a health pandemic to a system that's already not working for our students, that system is gonna be further destabilized and the impact is going to be felt even more um, by our students who have been most underserved by that system, right? And so I just don't want us to lose sight of that piece as we're talking about the recovery and as we're talking about the declines in enrollment. We've known that these challenges, that our students have had these challenges. We've always known. It's always had an impact. And so we're seeing the slower recovery for our students, right? Because our students have continued to be underserved. And I am hoping that we, um, as a sector, that we continue to focus on that piece and that we don't lose the lessons that we have learned over the past couple of years. And that we also understand that to, to, to reverse these numbers, not only do we need to do some shifts and redesign work, of the barriers and the structural barriers, and there are so many, don't think we need to get into all of them. And I know Brittany's already talked about a few, but we're gonna have to actively re-engage and re-enroll our students. So I'm proud of the work that we've done with Achieve Atlanta to actually re try to re-enroll and re-engage students. And that work has been pretty successful, students who have stopped out, but institutions and our sector in general are going to have to say, how do we actually reach back out to students and get them in? That approach of like, if we stay here, they'll just automatically come back <laughs> um, is not going to work. And so if we don't want these declines to be permanent, we're going to have to actively work on strategies to bring students back. And my fear, right, that is that these enrollment declines amount to more than just a series of individual tragedies, but could represent the lost economic mobility for young people and their families and potentially the progress of an entire generation. So I feel a sense of urgency around these numbers and I am hoping that our sector does too. Um, and that that pushes us to be much more active, strategic, deliberate, and intentional about bringing students back. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, you mentioned you know, COVID, you mentioned some of the structural barriers, uh, and I want to give you the three of you a chance to um, you know, respond to one last question, which is, you know, you, you've talked about some of the things that are already coming around the corner. There are some other research questions that this research raised, some further uh, research we'd like to do on some of that work. Um, is there anything you would like to add in terms of what you see coming around the corner and what advice you would give to others who may want to emulate this model? And I'll just open it up, John, Brittany, Alex. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I sadly I'll probably repeat myself a little bit. Hopefully, that's just, but I, I, you know, I think the importance of need based and within the construct of this place based model is super important. And there are there are now you know dozens and dozens of place based models popping up around the country, and it doesn't seem like there are signs of slowing. And so I, you know, I think thinking about what has worked here and and ways to potentially improve are just all positive signs for the future uh, across the country. Thank you, John. Brittany or Alex, anything else you want to add? Okay. So with that, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, no, no, no. no <laughs> I was waiting for Brittany to talk. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, combination of what John has said, right, that it, it, the importance of putting the two pieces together. And so the advice for any 
place-based model um, that is attempting to do the work, right? Place-based college financial aid programs that are attempting to do the work. Um, I think it is learning from Achieve Atlanta, you know, really looking at what are the elements and the components that have made this successful. And the elements are all of the things that we've talked about already, this sort of cross-sector um, collaboration, bringing stakeholders together at the table, including our students and parents and families and not, you know, forgetting that they are an important part of this equation, um, being able to uh, tap into the resources that already exist, particularly the way that Achieve Atlanta is tapping into colleges and universities. So to the extent that these institutions have um, advising or coaching models that work, tapping into that, and then also bringing in external partners, right, who may have the expertise to augment and to complement the work that is already being done. And so I just don't want to like, you know, double click on that piece that I do think it is an important component of the, of the success story. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing that I also want to give kudos to Achieve Atlanta for is that you're also thinking about the next step. It's not just important for students to persist and graduate. We have to help them transition to strong first jobs. And your partnership with Braven is helping to, to test that model and to do that. But that when we're talking about economic mobility for our students, that the degree alone is not enough, but we really have to focus on helping students uh, translate that degree right into into meaningful employment and again i think achieve atlanta is at the head of the uh, uh game by focusing on that piece while we continue to focus on persistence and graduation results thank you alex Brittany, is there anything you would like to add no i think between john and alex they covered it all <laughs> awesome well Thank you all. And with that, we'll now turn to our participants' questions. Um, we'll be adding Sam Rauschenberg, who is Chief Atlanta's Vice President of Organizational Effectiveness to our panel. Our panel. And as Sam joins us, I want you to please submit your questions for our panelists via the Q&A box. When you ask a question, please include your name, organization, and where you're joining us from so we know who you are. Uh, we have lots of questions, so we can only get to a few, but if we don't get to your question, we will make sure to email you back. Um, and so our first question, um, we had a question about access to our PowerPoint from this presentation. And the answer is yes, we'll be sharing the slides from today's presentation as a follow-up. So let's get to our first question. It's from Elise at Teach for America, and formerly one of our great partners at Atlanta Public Schools, and it's for John. What, if anything, did you learn about the differences between the kinds of institutions attended by scholars versus non-scholars, particularly in regard to academic match and or other factors like personal or financial fit? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. So it kind of falls in two parts. So first, um, so we, we don't see a whole lot of change in college enrollment. And when I, when I said college enrollment, I suppose I, I meant in terms of academic match as well. So it's not like students are much more likely to go to a four-year college versus a two-year college or a college that's um, more selective on some dimension or another. So we're not seeing big changes there, which is another way of saying the persistence results that we find do not appear to be driven by academic match. Academic or measures of fit, that's something we just don't have in the data but that's something I'm really excited to move to in, the, in this formal partnership where we're going to be conducting research. Actually, one of the, the strands of research is going to be employing Achieve Atlanta scholars who are attending Georgia State University, a lot of them do so, um, and helping fill, uh, do some qualitative work to figure out how students are, uh, what kind of a fit the college to which they're enrolling is, on a, quite a few dimensions, including affordability and, 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 other, and other measures. So hopefully we'll know more in the future, but I, I can't say whether or not uh, fit is driving some of these persistence results. Certainly financial fit is, seems to be, uh, is a likely candidate, but beyond that, we can't say too much. Thank you, John. This next question is for Alex and Brittany. A common theme throughout your work seems to be partnerships. What would you say have been the keys to successful partnerships? And we can start with Alex. I feel, fear I am going to sound like a broken record. 
<laughs> but I want to answer the question and I will say that the key to successful partnerships, and we have lots of partnerships, but the key is exactly what I talked about in terms of, of um, the way that we've partnered with Achieve Atlanta. I think it is the trust-based um, collaboration. I think it's mission and vision alignment, that there are very lots of organizations in the space that do this work, but starting with, do we have a common vision for what we want? students to achieve, right? Like, is that aligned? And are, are there values? Um, is there a values fit there? Um, I think the other piece is focusing on data. So being really upfront about what success looks like, what data we're going to collect to be able to measure that success, and how we're going to continue to evaluate um, the health of the partnership. And so really focusing on 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 that piece, the learning mindset that like no two partnerships are built the same. Um, and that the work that we're doing often starts with the hypothesis, right, of what we think we want for students and what we think we're going to achieve. So continuing to keep the lines of communication open and having the ability to pivot quickly as soon as we're learning from students that something may or may not be working to be able to come to the table and say, okay, this is what we're learning. This is what the data are telling us. How do we address these challenges? And so those for, for us are the components of successful partnerships and certainly are elements that have made our partnership with Achieve Atlanta successful. Thank you, Alex. Brittany, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I agree with everything Alex said. Um, what I do want to highlight, though, is the constant communication. I work with a lot of programs at our institution, and what aids us to do so well with Achieve Atlanta is we're constantly speaking and shifting throughout the semester. It's not one time a year we're speaking. It's every two, three months. If not, I know someone I can call and say, hey, this is something that we noticed, right? So I think the constant communication is what I've noticed to be the key compared to other programs that we have within our department of being able to look at our data all the time or speak. Um, in meetings and have a chance to constantly communicate and see how we can better support the students at our institution. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, this next question is for Sam. I'm interested to learn about how Achieve Atlanta set up the evaluation with GSU and determined the parameters of the study as well. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, from the early stages, we really wanted to be a data-driven organization. And so when we set out partnerships with the school district and with all the higher institutions and nonprofits, data sharing agreements were underneath all of that. Uh, but also we wanted to establish a relationship with an external evaluator so that we could understand our impact both in the short term and the long term. Um, in the early years, that was uh, more uh, uh, with smaller sample sizes and more internal focused, but that allowed us to, to work the kinks out and develop a longer term relationship where uh, John and his, his co-authors, uh, Lindsay Page and Carrie Cruz Bueno could uh, understand our culture and also understand, get, get used to the data sharing so that then when we had the necessary data uh, in terms of number of students, we could jump right into this analysis. And so that's how we got to this point, which we, we really see as step one uh, in this research practice partnership that John mentioned earlier, where we're going to dig into impact on financial wellness, as well as pull, pull in student voice and other qualitative factors we see as the really next step to make sure that we can understand our impact and continue to, to serve students better each day. Thank you, Sam. This next question is for John, and it's from Nick. Did you note any differences in student persistence when controlling for institution or institution type? I.e., did Achieve Atlanta scholars persist at higher rates than non-scholars within a given institution? It's a great question, and the answer is we noted a lack of differences. In other words, those sort of those differences in the bars that we showed when we counted for the exact college to which they enrolled, so just comparing two students, say at Georgia State University, those, those disparities in where scholars are persisting at much higher rates than non-scholars are, are remain, remain equally as strong and, and don't move at all. So, so to answer your question more shortly, it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's not driven by institution type but, uh, and where students are enrolled, but something else. Thank you. Okay, and this next question is for Sam. Um, how is Achieve Atlanta thinking about what's next for their scholars once they graduate from college? That's a, another great, great question. We, you know, as we focus so much on getting students to the finish line of a degree, uh, we then started to have a number of students. In fact, by the end of the year, we'll have a thousand uh, scholars who will have earned their college degree. 
And we started to see that transition to the workforce as another challenge for students as, as they get that strong first job. And so we've started to do some thinking, pulling in an, another group of partners uh, uh, through the Metro Chamber, Georgia Chamber, Braven, um, Spelman and Georgia State to come together and think about how do we, how do we serve students uh, in that transition to make sure they're poised for a strong first job that they can step into and be a springboard. Because ultimately, if our goal is social mobility, then that, that transition to the career is, is so critical for that next step. And so we're figuring that out right now, trying a few different things. And in the coming years, we expect that to be kind of part of our approach in terms of helping students transition to that next step. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have one other question, one last question that's coming in. I see. Have anything? I can just jump in one quick. I thought sorry, sure. that there was one quick technical question. Uh, in terms of students who may be from APS who would not take the scholarship, um, students in that case, there's lots of different reasons, but one of uh, some reasons could be they enroll part time in college instead of full time mm -hmm. in the farm of ours, as well as students. Um, if they enroll out of state, they have to enroll in an institution with a graduation rate above the national average. And so sometimes that's the case as well. But, um, you know, so that is some differences. But John's analysis, uh, John and, and Lindsay and, and Carrie, they controlled for that to the extent that they're able in terms of different specifications to try to rule out that the institution mattered. But uh, that's a, those are some of the reasons why a student might graduate from APS and go to college and be otherwise eligible, but not take our scholarship. Thank you, Sam. I have one last question for uh, Alex and Brittany. Um, what have you seen as a best practice in supporting your students? Both of you uh, come at this work um, from two different perspectives. So would like to hear what you see as a best practice or, or a successful practice uh, for supporting your students specifically. And I'll, I'll start with Brittany. I would say, the key thing that works for us is the one-on-one -on -one connection and building rapport with students so they know who to come back to when they need help to remove some barriers that they face, whatever barriers in their way to persist. So we try to build relationships. What's great about Achieving Land is we have goals set actually with one-on-one -on -one connection. So we try to meet with, the goal is 90% of students each semester. But what we notice is compared to other programs that we may have at our institution, that the goal of meeting with students one-on-one, -on -one, creating those relationships from even before they start on our campus, helping them navigate their classes their first year, and even giving them a nudge to graduation, um, that one-on-one -on -one connection kind of aids them to persist. So I think there's so many factors. But for me, I want to highlight today just making one-on-one -on -one connections, making sure they're assigned to somebody that's in their corner, and um, for us to reach out to them as much as we can um, to aid them on their journey. Thank you, Brittany. Alex? Um, it's, it's actually the same as Brittany. So for us, it is, uh, we, we approach this through coaching and we have a near peer coaching model where we hire recent college graduates who themselves were the first in their families to go to college. So they understand firsthand the challenges that students are facing on their road to earning a college degree. And so each Achieve Atlanta scholar that we work with is assigned to a near peer coach who stays with them for their first two years. And for us, that's the, that's the key, right? An ecosystem of support. Our coaches are not meant to be duplicative. So they're not financial aid advisors. They're not, you know, tutors, but really aides who have been through it themselves and who can say, hey, I've been through it and let me help you understand how to navigate your campus's resources so that you can be successful. So foundationally, it's a near peer coach and then also using technology to augment um, the support of those coaches by sending evidence-based nudges to remind students of the activities, deadlines, and behaviors that lead to success. Thank you, Alex. Um, that's all the time we have. And I'd love to thank you and everyone for these insightful questions. Um, if your question was not answered, we'll email a reply to you. Um, please contact us at info at achieveatlanta.org if you have further questions or want to talk with us. I want to also thank all of our panelists today. We had a robust discussion and I think we can all say we learned something new. Uh, thank you for joining John, Alex, and Brittany. We appreciate the time and insights you shared with us. If you'd like to read our summary about the evaluation findings we just discussed, you can find it on Achieve Atlanta's homepage at achieveatlanta.org. Thank you to everyone tuning in from your home, from your office, and have a great rest of the week.